Section one. You will hear a tourist asking about cruises round the harbour. First, look at questions one to seven. Now listen to the first part of the conversation, and complete questions one to seven on the table. Good morning, Blue Harbour Cruises. How can I help you? Oh, um, um, good morning. Um, can you tell me something about the different cruises you run? Well, we run three cruises every day, each offering something slightly different. Oh, let me just get a pencil so I can make a note of this. Right. Firstly, there's the highlight cruise. Then we do the noon cruise, and we also have our coffee cruise. Hmm. Could you tell me a bit about them? When they leave, how often, that sort of thing. Well, the highlight cruise is sixteen dollars per person, and that leaves at nine thirty every morning and takes two hours to go around the harbour. Right, nine thirty. And do you get coffee or refreshments? No, but there's a kiosk on board where you can buy drinks and snacks, and we do provide everyone with a free souvenir postcard. Right. And then there's our noon cruise at forty-two dollars per person. Th this is more expensive, but Of course, it takes longer, and for that price, you get a three-course lunch. Oh, that sounds good. And what about the last one? That's the coffee cruise. Well, that's twenty-five dollars each. It takes two and a half hours. When does that leave? At a quarter past two daily. And presumably, the coffee is included. Yes, and sandwiches are served free of charge. Now you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. As you listen to the rest of the conversation, answer questions eight to ten. I think the coffee cruise would suit us best, as lunch is included at the hotel. Can I book for two people for tomorrow, please? No need to book. Just be down at the quay at two o'clock. All our cruises depart from jetty number two. Can you tell me where that is exactly? Yes, number two jetty is opposite the shops. It's clearly signposted. Right. And can you tell me, is there a commentary? Yes, there's a commentary on all the cruises. Is it possible to listen to the commentary in Japanese? My friend doesn't speak much English. It's in English only, I'm afraid. But the tour guides usually speak some Japanese, so she'll be able to ask questions. Oh, fine. Oh, and one other thing, I should just mention that it gets extremely hot on the upper deck at this time of year, so it's a good idea to wear a hat. Otherwise, you could get quite badly sunburnt. Right, I'll remember that. Thanks very much. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Two. You will hear an extract from a talk about employment interviews. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Today I have with me Sandy Richardson of the local workforce center, and she'll be talking about that critical step towards the goal of employment: the interview. Sandy, what is an interview for, and what's the best way to approach it? 
A job interview is simply a meeting between you and a potential employer to discuss your qualifications and see if there is a fit. The employer wants to verify what they know about you and talk about your qualifications. If you have been called for an interview, you can assume that the employer is interested in you. The employer has a need that you may be able to meet, so it's your goal to identify that need and convince the employer that you're the one for the job. As everyone knows, interviews can be stressful, but when you're well prepared, there's no reason to panic. Preparation is the key to success in a job search, and you can begin by collecting together all the documents you may need for the interview, such as extra copies of your resume, lists of references, and letters of recommendation. You could also take some work samples, selecting from what you have designed, drawn, or written, for instance. And make sure you have a pen and pad of paper for taking notes. The next step is to find out about the post. The more you know about the job, the employer, and the industry, the better prepared you will be to target your qualifications. Always request a job description from the employer and research employer profiles at the Chamber of Commerce or local library. You could also try to network with people who work for the company or with employees of companies associated with it. The next step is to match your qualifications to the requirements of the job. A good approach is to write out your qualifications along with the job requirements. Think about some standard interview questions and how you might respond. Most questions are designed to find out more about you, your qualifications, or to test your reactions in a given situation. If you don't have any experience or skills in a required area, think about how you might compensate for those deficiencies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. During an interview, it's important that you be yourself. Get a good night's sleep and plan your travel to be there in plenty of time so that you're not arriving out of breath with 30 seconds to spare. Don't, though, present yourself for the interview too early, 10 minutes at most. In the interview, listen carefully to each question asked. Take your time in responding and make sure your answers are positive. It's important to express a good attitude and show that you're willing to work, eager to learn, and are flexible. If you are unsure of a question, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. In fact, it's sometimes a good strategy to close a response with a question for the interviewer. In general, focus on your qualifications and look for opportunities to personalize the interview. Briefly answer questions with examples of how you responded in comparable situations from either your life or previous job experiences. Something you should avoid are yes or no responses to questions, but don't dwell too long on non-job related topics. Use caution if you are questioned about your salary requirements. The best strategy is to avoid the question until you have been offered a job. Questions about salary asked before there is a job offer are usually screening questions that may eliminate you from consideration, so be warned. On the other hand, it isn't inappropriate to show your enthusiasm if your first impressions of the interview and of the employer are good ones. So, if the job sounds like what you are looking for, say so. Keep in mind that the interview is not over when you are asked if you have any questions. Come prepared to ask a couple of specific questions that, again, show your knowledge and interest in the job. Close the interview in the same friendly, positive manner in which you started. When the interview is over, leave promptly. Don't overstay your time. Think about the interview and learn from the experience. Evaluate the success and failures. 
the more you learn from the interview, the easier the next one will become. You'll become much more confident. To close, here are a few more tips. First, maintain good eye contact throughout the interview and be aware of nonverbal body language. Second, dress a step above what you would wear on the job. Go to the hairdressers, have a shave, etc. Remember that your appearance is a key indicator of whether you have the right attitude, so it can pay to give some thought to how you look. And finally, don't be a clock watcher. That is the end of section two. Now turn to section three on page sixty nine. Section 3. You will hear two university students, Phil and Stella, talking to their tutor about their research project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27 on pages 69 and 70. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Come in. Ah, yes, Stella. Is Phil there too? Mm -hmm. Good. Come on in. OK, so you're here to discuss your research project. Have you decided what to focus on? You were thinking of something about the causes of mood changes, weren't you? Yes, but the last time we saw you, you suggested we narrowed it down to either the effects of weather or urban environment, so we've decided to focus on the effects of weather. Right, that's more manageable. So, your goal is, uh, Phil? To prove the hypothesis, no, to investigate the hypothesis that the weather has an effect on a person's mood. Hmm, good. And uh, what's your thesis, Stella? Well, our thesis is that in general, when the weather's good, it has a positive effect on a person's mood, and bad weather has a negative effect. Hmm. Uh, can you define your terms here? For example, what do you mean by good and bad? OK. Well, good would be sunny, warm weather, and bad would be when it's cold and cloudy or raining. And how would you define an effect on a person's mood? What would you be looking to find? An effect on the way a person feels. Mm -hmm. uh, a change in the way they feel, um, like from feeling happy and optimistic to sad and depressed. Right. And what sort of weather variables will you be looking at? Oh, sunshine, temperature, cloudiness, precipitation, among others. It'll depend a bit what the weather's like when we do the survey. Fine. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, what about background reading? I gave you some suggestions. Did you manage to read any of it? Yes. We read the Ross Vickers article, the one comparing the groups of American Marines training in summer and winter. Hmm. That's quite relevant to our study. It was interesting because the Marines who were training in the cold winter conditions tried to cheer themselves up by thinking of warm places, but it didn't really work. Hmm. Yes. They were trying to force themselves to have a positive mental outlook, but in fact it had the opposite effect, and they ended up in a very negative state of mind. And we found some more research by someone who wasn't on the reading list you gave us, George Whitebourne. He compared people living in three countries with very different climatic conditions. Actually, he looked at several things, not just the weather – but he found some people's reactions to bad weather were much worse than others, and it was linked to how stressed they were generally. Uh, the weather on its own didn't have such a significant effect on mood. And we looked at a paper by Haver... Haverton. Yeah. He broke weather up into about 15 or 16 categories and did qualitative and quantitative research. 
he found that humans respond to conditions in the weather with immediate responses, such as fear or amazement. But these responses can also be linked to associations from their earlier life, such as a particular happy or sad event.、Uh, did you have a look at Stanfield's work? Yes, it was interesting because the type of questions he asked was similar to what we were planning to use in our survey. Yes. He asked people how they were feeling on days with good and bad weather. He found the biggest factors seemed to be the humidity. Moods were most negative on days with a lot of rainfall. Long periods without sunshine had some effect, but nothing like as much.、Hmm. That could be quite a useful model for your project. Yes, we thought so too. Although we can't continue our survey for as long as he did, he did his over a six-month period. You now have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty, on page seventy. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Right. Well, you've made quite a good start.、Uh, so, where are you going from here? Well, we've already made the questionnaire we're going to use for the survey. It's quite short, just eight questions. We're aiming to survey twenty people over a period of three months from October to December. We can't specify the actual dates yet because it depends on the weather. We want to do the survey on days with a range of different weather conditions. And we'll just be working on campus, so our data will only be statistically sound for the student population here. That's okay. Have you thought how you'll determine what will constitute each aspect of weather, and how many you're looking at? We decided on four: the amount of sunshine, cloudiness, temperature, and precipitation. We thought we might use the internet to get data on weather conditions on the days we do the survey, but we haven't found the information we need. So we might have to measure it ourselves. We'll see. Then we've got to analyse the results, and we'll do that using a spreadsheet, giving numeric values to answers. And then, of course, we have to present our findings to the class, and we want to make it quite an interactive session. We want to involve the class in some way in the presentation, maybe by trying to create different climatic conditions in the classroom. <laughs> But we're still thinking about it. I see. Well, that sounds as if you're on the right lines. Now, what I'd suggest that you think about, in addition to the work. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Exam listening, section four. You will hear part of a lecture about the school calendar. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. So, having seen that the six-term system has passed the test of cost-effectiveness, we can move on to the educational aspects of this arrangement. Firstly, all the terms would be approximately the same length. Instead of terms up to thirteen weeks, which we have now, there could be a repeating pattern of seven weeks of term time plus two weeks of vacation. This would be repeated six times per year. How does this affect the effectiveness of the educational provision? The most noticeable result would be that the very long summer holiday would be reduced in length. This byproduct of the six-term system could be beneficial. There's plenty of evidence of huge learning loss by pupils during the summer holidays. By learning loss, we mean the amount that pupils forget or lose during a holiday break. Ashley carried out a number of analyses which showed this conclusively. He investigated 39 studies examining the effects of summer holidays on standardized test scores. 
His analyses indicated that summer learning loss equaled two weeks to seven weeks of instruction. On average, children's test scores were three weeks lower than when they left school in the previous term. He also found differences in the learning loss effect according to subject. The subjects he analysed were reading, writing and maths, and he found that the effect was greatest in maths and reading. Furthermore, although all social groups experienced roughly similar learning loss in the field of maths, the studies found that disadvantaged children showed even greater losses in reading skills. So, the problem of learning loss in traditional schools is clear. However, the results of studies into the six-term system and learning loss are ambiguous. Marchmont found that pupils in six-term schools maintained their test scores after the shorter holiday period. This is certainly an improvement on the traditional system where, as we have seen, pupils perform worse after the summer break. Benson, however, found no differences between those in traditional schools and on the six-term schedule. It would seem reasonable that if long holidays result in learning loss, then shorter holidays should result in less learning loss. So, we await the outcome of further studies. Historically, of course, everyone knows the reason for our system of three terms per year. In days when agriculture was of much greater importance in our working lives, it was essential that the children helped with the harvest. Later on, this changed and more people moved into the towns. But then there was a new problem. Before air conditioning, it was very impractical to try to teach children in the summer months. Nowadays, that's no longer a barrier. One way of providing something different is the summer school. Here, there is a completely different kind of educational provision. Cooper and others investigated 93 summer schools and the results they achieved. They all had a positive effect on learning. Most summer schools, of course, have small classes and class size was shown to have a positive effect. Additionally, summer school children usually benefit from a great deal of parental support, not least because payment of fees is involved, and this, as so often, was shown to produce very good outcomes. Results were most impressive, in maths in general.